IS have been showing real leadership and innovation. I will give a insufficient, but at least proper introduction to Dr. Karstens in a moment, just to say that this is the continuing part of what we're calling March Macro Madness or Macro Week at the Peterson Institute. Yesterday, we hosted Federal Reserve Vice Chair for Supervision and FSB Chair Randy Quarles for a speech. And on Monday, we hosted Christopher Waller, the newest member of the Federal Reserve Board of Governors. All of these, in addition to today's remarks and discussion with Dr. Karstens, will, take, will be posted on the Peterson Institute website. And of course, the BIS also has all the materials and the speech and the materials to go with his remarks. Tomorrow, we will have the semi-annual Global Economic Prospects meeting of the Peterson Institute. My colleague, Karen Dynan, will be presenting her, and slash our, but her uh, global outlook, in particular going in depth on the outlook for the US. And I will offer some remarks myself on whether we have seen a regime shift in monetary policy at this point. But today, again, we're very privileged to have with us Augustine Karstens. Uh, Dr. Karstens uh, has became man general manager of the BIS uh, just over three years ago on December 1st, 2017. He was governor of the Bank of Mexico from 2010 to 2017, which totally understates uh, his uh, role as a pillar of stability and, and honesty and intellectual clarity in Mexico throughout that period. Um, he was a member of the BIS board from 2011 to 2017, chair of the Global Economy Meeting, in the Economic Consultative Committee from 2013 until he became general manager. He also chaired the International Monetary and Financial Committee, the IMF's Policy Advisory Committee from 2015 to 2017. Uh, Mr. Carstens began his career in 1980 at the Bank of Mexico. From 1999 to 2000, he was the executive director for Mexico at the IMF. He later served as Mexico's deputy finance minister and as deputy managing director at the IMF. And finally, as Mexico's finance minister. So he is one of the truly great macroeconomic public servants of our era. Um, Mr. Carsons holds an MA and a PhD from the University of Chicago. I would also note uh, that he gave the 15th annual Stavros Niarchos Foundation Lecture, our main annual honorary lecture at the Peterson Institute in April of 2015. While we've spoken to him many times since then, it's a pleasure to welcome him back formally to our stage today. Augustine, thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much, Adam, and uh, thank you to the Peterson Institute for the invitation to speak uh, today. As always, it is a pleasure to join you, even if virtually. So my main topic will be today about central bank digital currencies or CBDCs. Uh, I would say that this is indeed even the talk of the town. Many central banks are hard at work on research and development. The Central Bank of the Bahamas recently launched its San Dollar, and the People's Bank of China is piloting the so-called electronic yuan. In the US, the Federal Reserve System is doing extensive research on CBDCs, including work with MIT. At the BIS, uh, our new innovation hub is complementing this work with many CBDC projects. We are also conducting research on the economics of CBDCs and supporting dialogue among central banks through the VIS committees. Certainly, there is a lively public and academic debate on CBDCs, including in the US on proposals for a digital dollar. Yet once we scratch the surface of this debate, there are fundamental questions. How does a CBDC differ from today's money? What would the CBDC mean for users, central banks, financial institutions, and the international monetary system. I will outline how we can put this big idea into practice. I will argue that CBDCs are a technologically advanced representation of central bank money. If well designed, they could offer a safe, neutral, and final means of settlement for the digital economy. CBDCs appear similar to payment vehicles provided by other infrastructures such as retail fast payment systems that are based on commercial bank money. These are being rolled out around the world and make funds available in or near real time. Indeed, CBDC's fast payment systems and supporting 24-7 wholesale payment systems 
form a continuum of potential improvements to the payment system. However, I will argue that the unique characteristics of central bank money distinguish CBDCs from commercial bank money and from cryptocurrencies and stable coins. Building on that, I will discuss CBDCs from the user perspective. I will outline the operations involved and the role of financial institutions. Finally, I will discuss the possible impact on the international monetary system, where I feel that some clarifications are in order. Contrary to some of the hyper, uh, hyperbole around international currency competition, central banks' work on CBDCs is a global collaborative effort. So, what is a CBDC and how does it compare with other payment options? A CBDC is a digital payment instrument denominated in the national unit of account. Like cash, it is a di direct liability of the central bank. It provides a new digital form of central bank money. And, and, and this is a safe, neutral, and ultimate settlement medium that can extinguish all claims in a transaction. As you know, today's payment system is a public-private partnership with two tiers. On the central bank balance sheet, you have cash and commercial banks deposit at the central bank or reserves, uh, as can be seen in this graph. Uh, the private sector provides commercial bank money, you, commercial bank money. Users access this through bank transfer checks, credit and debit card and ATMs. Between these two, you have constant clearing on the central bank's balance sheet using central bank money. Now, central bank participation in this process has several features. First, the central bank offers the ultimate means of settlement, eliminating any residual risks involved in making payments. Second, it oils the wheels of the payment system by creating this settlement medium on demand. And third, in times of stress, it can act as a lender of last resort. These features, finality, intraday liquidity, and lender of last resort, are central banks' key contributions to the payment system. They ensure its safety, trustworthiness, and operational efficiency. Another important feature is neutrality. As a non-commercial party, the central bank holds a trusted role at the, central, at the center of the system. So comparing CBDC with these existing elements of the payment system, bank reserves can be seen as CBDCs for exclusive use by commercial banks. Financial institutions hold reserves at the central bank and use them for interbank settlement in the payment system. These are these green uh, square in this graph. Payment in central bank money are final and free of credit and liquidity risk. Settlement in central bank money is hence ultimate and plays a fundamental role in the financial system. CBDCs open up possibilities for other new types of central bank money. They can be for wholesale use just among commercial banks or retail use for the general public. They can offer uh, through accounts. They, they can, I one second. Can you? They can offer through accounts at the central bank where ownership depends on personal identification or through cash like digital tokens where ownership depends on holding the token. Since commercial banks reserves are already digital, they are effectively a form of CBDC. Central banks are also exploring token-based wholesale CBDCs as a new way for financial institutions to directly access and pay in central bank money. I will not go into this, but let me just note that the Innovation Hub project Helvetia showed it is feasible to integrate tokenized assets and central bank money. Retail CBDCs grab more attention. This would give the general public a digital means to access central bank money. They could be a new form of digital cash complementing physical cash. To see what it would mean for consumers and merchants, take the, take the example of a shopper buying 100 worth of groceries. 
let's compare in graph in the in this graph a retail CBDC payment with a typical transaction today executed to a fast payment systems or FPS. The customer's payment provides final funds to the merchant immediately and at any time. Our consumer pays 100 and it arrives at real time in the shop's account. However, settlement between banks on the central bank balance sheet is typically not instant. This implies a loan, the merchant bank's credits its account in real time, while the merchant bank has an account payable vis-a-vis -vis the consumer bank, as we see in this next graph. In, an, a, 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 in a fast payment system with deferred settlement, great exposures between banks accumulate during the delay. However, exposures are fully collateralized, an institutional safeguard designed or required by the central bank. All claims are extinguished only once the net of all retail fund transfers is settled on the central bank books. As this next graph shows, there is no further credit or liquidity risk. We see that even in commercial bank payment system, central bank money is essential. But central bank money and the institutional arrangements of the central bank provide finality and allow the functions of liquidity credit and lender of last resort. This linking of systems and granting of liquidity and credit makes settlement at different points in time safer. The same transaction in a CBDC-based payment system would be much more simpler as shown in this graph. A payment system transfers direct claims on the central bank from one user to another. There is no credit risk as funds are not on the balance sheet of an intermediary. Transactions are settled directly in central bank money on the central bank's balance sheets in real time. Payments in, is conducted fully in safe and neutral central bank money with immediate finality. CBDC's architectures could differ in their operational setup and in how the private and public sectors work together to allow seamless payments. But direct settlement in central bank money is common to all. In fact, this is the quintessential feature of CBDC-based payment system. There is a continuum of innovations that central banks are currently working on. These include retail CBDCs, retail fast payment systems, and supporting 24-7 central bank payment systems. This could include wholesale CBDCs. From the user perspective, these solutions may look very similar, as we can see in this table, but only focus on the top line. What really distinguishes retail uh, free uh, uh, fast payment systems for, from a retail CBDC is that the latter is a central bank liability offering the unique features of central bank money. This could be a key difference. Is this a major issue? It shouldn't be but could be in some states of the world. An individual's decision to hold the CBDC or commercial bank money will depend mainly on the value added by commercial banks in terms of overall service and their perceived safety. This is why, why there is regulation and supervision and the complex clearing and settlement system provided by the central bank. Still in the extreme, History shows we cannot rule out runs on commercial banks. This has happened with wholesale central bank money as when interbank markets froze during the great financial crisis. Central banks resolved this by acting as lender of last resort. CBDC does need, need to strike a balance between reducing the exposure to bank run risk and the need to enhance competition and improve society's experience with the payment system. I will come back to this later. Let me note here in by passing that a major difference with cryptocurrencies and stable coins is that these are not backed by any central bank infrastructure. Now let's look into the user experience with retail CBDCs. If issued, what would CBDCs mean in practice for users? Gaining access to a retail CBDC could look much like any private digital payment option today. A bank or 
a bank or payment service provider would open an account or wallet for the user. It would conduct know your customer checks and ensure compliance with anti-money laundering and financing of terrorism requirement. It would address cases of payment fraud. This would depend on proper identification and rules on privacy of transactions data as, as we see in uh, the left-hand side panel of graph seven. Funds could be transferred from a bank account, credit card, or other payment service to CBDC wallet. Conversely, the user would need to be able to convert the CBDC at par with any other form of money, funds in a bank account or digital wallets or cash, as shown in this graph. User would, would need to be able to pay using a variety of payment devices, such as prepaid CBDC devices, cards, self-standing smartphone wallets, and payment apps, as we see in this panel. CBDC design efforts aim to address both long-standing and emerging issue in payments. For a long time, payments have suffered from high fees for credit cards and cross-border payments, and not everyone can access digital payment tools. More recently, weaknesses have emerged in governance frameworks on big tech and other providers' use of transaction data. Wide use of retail CBDCs could create more efficient payment systems and improve the welfare of the general public. Now, it is clear from this discussion that issuing and operating a retail CBDC would involve a very large operational effort, and this would not be up to the central bank alone. In payments, central banks and commercial banks are joined at the hip. Central banks are not set up to do all the client-facing tasks. They do not, not even do this today. Commercial banks distribute and process cash. With CBDCs, central banks and commercial banks will need to find a balanced arrangement. We need to grasp the advantages of greater competition through CBDCs, but continue to ensure the safety and integrity of the financial system. A recent report by a group of central banks uh, here at the BIS, BIS lays out foundational principles for CBDCs, including the monetary Hippocratic Oath, do not harm. Just as doctors have a duty to their patients, so do central banks to society. Crucially, this is not about protecting the vested interests of incumbent financial institutions. It is about creating a more efficient financial system and economy, supporting central banks' mission of providing monetary and financial stability and economic growth. CBDC would be part of an ecosystem with a range of private providers. Similar to fast payment systems, retail CBDCs may even allow other new players into the payments market. More competition could further lower transaction fees and encourage innovation. Rules would be needed to share the costs between the public and private sector, as with cash or checks today. A flood of new players could disrupt markets, a natural and healthy process. This is part of Schumpeterian creative destruction and has helped make modern economies successful and adaptable. Digital disruption has already arrived in payments. Big tech payment services are growing fast. They have offered many benefits, including to financial inclusion. But as we have seen in China and other places, they can quickly become dominant, creating world gardens. These may be very convenient for users, but they are closed loop systems that do not allow for data protection or competition. These risks undermine, undermine under, precisely this risk undermining the benefit of competition. This could be especially large for big tech-backed stablecoins. Central banks should not get involved in intermediating. Sorry, central banks should not get involved in intermediating savings in the economy. While CBDCs could pressure banks' profits, they are not intended to crowd out banks and they need not to do so even if they pay interest. 
Of course, runs can occur. Central banks worry about digital runs from banks to CBDCs in times of stress. So some frictions to control inflows into the CBDC, CBDC will be needed. In this light, whether to pay interest is an important decision and can influence the ultimate size of CBDCs. Cash do, does not pay interest. The value of cash in circulation remains comparatively small in most countries. My sense is that CBDCs should also be small in size relative to the financial system, acting more as a means of payment than a store of value. Still, by offering users another option, they could put competitive pressure on other means of payment, thus winning a broader influence. Central banks today do not need to issue a CBDC for monetary policy reasons, but the CBDC would still affect the transmission and implementation of monetary policy. It would affect the interaction with commercial banks and the reserve holdings, the monetary base and the demand for money. These effects should be studied carefully. Now, let me address uh, the final question, which is what CBDCs would mean for the international monetary system. There is rightfully a lively debate on this, but I feel there is also some confusion on key issues. I offer three observations to put the debate on a firmer footing. First, CBDCs could enhance the efficiency of cross-border payments without creating a new global unit of account as global stablecoins envisage. In particular, there is promise in multi-CBDCs or MCBDC arrangements to improve the interaction of CBDCs across borders. I'm convinced that the future of the international financial system relies on fostering the seamless convertibility of one sovereign currency into another. This is precisely the solution that central banks have sought for many years and are continuing to seek now. MCBDC arrangements could start from a clean slate and thereby tackle frictions in today's correspondent banking system. A recent paper of here at the VIS lets out the technological options uh, that are for this MCBDC. These are enhancing the compat compatibility of national CBDCs interlinking CBDCs through shared technical interfaces and integrating CBDCs into a single system. These are not just theoretical considerations. I can preview for you today a new survey of Central Bank that shows some progress in this. This suggests that each of these models is under consideration. The option of interlinking CBDCs seem to be gaining particular traction though the work here is still in its infancy. A second observation concerns the risks of currency substitution. That is widespread adoption of a foreign retail CBDC. This can also be understood as digital dollarization or insert the currency of your choice here. Central banks know CBDCs could, in principle, make it even easier for users to adopt a foreign digital alternative. Again, this comes out of the, the recent survey that as we show in this graph. Yet most CBDC's proposal to date are account-based, tied to a clear identification scheme and rightly so. It's crucial to trace transactions, particularly large ones to one individual or entity. Issuing central banks would retain control over cross-border use. Restricting non-residents access reduces the risk of volatile flows and of currency substitution in receiving economies. Where token-based CBDCs are being considered, it is generally for smaller transactions and with clear limits and safeguards. Moreover, there are policy tools in receiving economies to address the concerns of digital currency substitution. In particular, robust legal tender provisions may promote the use of the national currency in domestic payments. Above all, central banks must continue to ensure a stable domestic currency, so users prefer it to foreign CBDCs. Third, some have argued that there is a first mover advantage in CBDCs, or even that CBDCs could become an instrument of international reserve currency competition 
or of geopolitics. Much of this rhetoric is overblown. Central banks operate under domestic mandates and will decide to issue a CBDC only when it is appropriate for the jurisdiction circumstances. International reserve currency status is driven by a range of factors, ranging from the depth of markets to confidence in the country's legal infrastructure. It is unlikely that a digital currency will take off as a global reserve currency due to its digital nature alone. In any event, international cooperation is critical in addressing these issues. At the global level, I see regular cooperation between central banks on monetary issues. CBDC design is a global effort of collaboration rather than competition. Efforts to improve cross-border payments are coordinated by the G20 and conceived in international forums. At the BIS Innovation Hub, such work is being put into practice in joint collaborative projects. The result of this global collaboration will be improved international payment arrangement. Globally coordinated CBDC design efforts and MCBDC arrangements will also offer a worthy alternative to private issued stable coins or cryptocurrencies. I am confident that open dialogue between central banks, each in close consultation with their own societies, can foster cooperative policy outcomes. Let me conclude. CBDCs are an opportunity for central banks to offer a technologically advanced representation of central bank money for the digital economy. The main novelty is that CBDCs offer the unique characteristics of central bank money as safe, neutral, and final. They are not necessarily the best option for every jurisdiction. Retail fast payment systems in particular may offer similar benefits. For users, both may look similar. Central banks around the world will each act in line with their mandates, reflecting the unique circumstances and objectives of their society. In both cases, the private sector will need to play a key role in retail-facing services, account opening, and a range of further activities. While CBDCs may improve efficiency and foster innovation competition in payments, they should not open today's two-tier financial system. Cooperation across borders ensures that central banks can continue to learn from one another and to grasp the opportunities of CBDCs for cross-border payments. This is very much a global collaborative effort aimed at building mutually beneficial outcomes. The BIS is proud to support this work for the benefit of all. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Carstens. Um, it is a encompassing agenda and you and your colleagues at the BIS, including notably the BIS Innovation Hub you've created, are playing a key role in bringing CBDCs forward. You gave a speech with the intent of talking about how to make this happen in practice. And so a number of my questions and the questions from our audience are in that direction. And some of this will be asking you to expand on or clarify things you've already said. Um, so first off, why, I mean, we, a number of us still have questions about why this is so important and why this is a public interest. So, I mean, for example, why is it important for retail customers to transact in central bank money compared to well-established, already regulated retail payment systems that use digital commercial bank money? Couldn't the purported benefits of CBDC be realized with upgrades to the payment system that already exists? Why, why do we need this new push? Okay, um, well, that's a that's an excellent question, <laughs> and we probably should start always a debate with this. Um, I would I would say at this stage that there are probably two two main issues. One, uh, it's a more practical one. One is probably a little bit more so philosophical or societal. Uh, in some countries. Uh, uh, you, you, where already uh, digital payments uh, are dominant, uh, there, there is the sense that they do not want to lose, uh, I would say, the option to hold CVDC uh, as a retail payment vehicle 
with all the guarantees that bring that that brings with it. Uh, I mean, and, and the, what is the, what is the, the what is the, the the fear today? The fear is that cash might disappear. And cash, in a way, is going out. Obviously, we don't want to eliminate cash, but just revealed preference in some countries is showing that cash will be used less and less and less and less. Now, if you want to have an option where you can hold a claim on the central bank, if everything is digital based on commercial bank money, you don't have that option. So societies are demanding that option. So in a way, it's incumbent to the central bank to offer that option uh, in digital form. Uh, now, of course, that brings all set of considerations that I already uh, expressed in my presentation. Now, the other uh, is that uh, we tend to look into very developed, efficient uh, commercial bank-based or not commercial bank-based payment systems that are very efficient. But there are many, many parts of the world where they are not efficient and where some form of leapfrogging into something new, where there is less dominance of the industry, let's put it in that way, would be very helpful. So to have this to be a, a, a more a, 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 a factor of competition would be very, very desirable. As I say, the way of approaching this is not necessarily as here comes the public option and let's displace private uh, options, but more as, 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 as I try to explain in my speech, uh, even if we want a, a CBDC for retail, very likely would we'll have to depend on very heavy participation of the financial industry. So my sense is that we could achieve more competition, more, 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 more pressure, on the quality of services that, that banks provide, and in that way enhance society's experience with payments, uh, payments options. Thank you. Um, again, the, the issue is the question as a, of in practice versus the intent. And so particularly, I'd like a number of our questions are on the issue of banks. And, and you've said very clearly that it's not the intent to push banks out, crowd banks out, and you just finished saying you're gonna need, not you, the, uh, an initiative for CBDC would need participation in retail. But it, it does seem like there is the potential for the central bank balance sheet to end up sucking in a lot of the payment flow, a lot of consumer site deposits, and then the bank's balance, the private sector bank's balance sheets would, would shrink, or maybe I'm missing something here, but but why, what beyond good intent do you need to take into account so that this doesn't make the banking system less stable? Well, I mean, for sure there are many margins into which the, the commercial banks can compete and can offer more to, to the public, no? Uh, uh, I mean, uh, uh, it is a little bit the balance that exists today between cash and uh, and uh, and uh, digital payments. Uh, I think that uh, uh, you know uh, the one one immediate aspect is probably interest payments. Uh, how, what other value added on top of the basic infrastructure where, or of the wallet that in, on which the CBC could be operated is offered, is offered to the public? How fast can you exchange one type of financial instrument for another? Uh, our sense is that uh, this would be, let's say, a safe asset, but it would be a safe asset that would be, I would say, uh, under normal circumstances, le less coveted because there are other characteristics of com commercial bank money that, that, that would make the other options more, more attractive. Now, here we have to be very honest and at some point under certain circumstances, as I mentioned, uh, we might need to, to impose some restrictions on CBDC that are similar to the restrictions that, that, that happen with cash. 
For example, I mean, cash is available, but if you go to your branch into the co in the corner and say, I want $1 million uh, in cash, they probably say, well, you know, come, I have to ask my supervisor, uh, you will need to, to bring probably a truck, an armored car to take your $1 million. We need to make an appointment or it just might, might tell you, look, it's not possible, no? So those type of restrictions might have to be imposed on CBDC. We don't know this today. And therefore we need to explore precisely how this interface or, or, or this private public partnership between central banks and a, and financial institution will work. I mean, that's why we put this so heavily in this agenda, because if we want to make this work, we need to have, we need to strike the adequate balance between uh, the, the, the benefits that CBDC provide and how these benefits can be exploited massively uh, without central bank banks having to go into providing those direct services. And I think a major thing we want to avoid is, is the consequence of what you said, that is that CBDC becomes so powerful that at some point uh, the central bank is receiving all, let's say, liquid deposits of people, and therefore central banks need to be engaged in intermediating savings. That is something we don't want to do. <laughs> I mean, I would say by and large, no central bank want to be in a decision where it has to decide where it has to reallocate those resources. So uh, again, this is a game of balances and, uh, and, and, and precisely part of the uh, objective of, of, of my speech is precisely to be very precise on what are the issues that we need to tackle to make these options work. Thank you. And speaking in terms of those balances very clearly and drawing the line at no reasonable central bank wants to be intermediating household savings accounts. Um, can we turn to the international aspects, which of course you at the BIS are critical to and what you mentioned in your speech I mean, just as we said about banks, you mentioned the possibility that there could be digital dollarization, or at least that some people, including some colleagues of ours, are quite concerned about this. Um, you mentioned that the intent is not to do that, but could you, but your experience at the IMFC, at the Bank of Mexico, I mean, you're, you're accustomed to the idea that when people don't like their local currency, they can get very creative about getting their money out. And then that makes the regulators and the central bankers job more difficult to make the currency work. So beyond the intent that this is not supposed to disrupt emerging market developing country currencies, how do you make that work? Well, I mean, again, we, we don't need to to go beyond of what we do today. Uh, if, 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 if you are a foreigner and you want to, to open a US dollar account in a local bank in Washington, it's very difficult. <laughs> and I know because I'm a foreigner that I have done that by necessity when I worked at the fund. The same happens when you come to the VAS and, and, and want to open an account in Swiss francs. They ask you, why do you want the account, blah, 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 and they, where are you going to get the money? Where is the money coming from? And so on and so forth. Uh, traditionally, that happens. Uh, uh, therefore, this would not imply new type of restrictions. Now, the, 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 the logical consequence of what I said is that just massive dollarization through, through bank accounts is, is, is relatively difficult. I mean, it usually happens to, to saving vehicles, uh, to investment alternatives in the wholesale market. And that is something that this, this, those dimensions of the traditional capital inflows and outflows and currency substitution in financial markets would not be affected. Uh, I would say what, what most people worry about is that at some point, yes, uh, instead of paying with pesos, you start paying with dollars. And there is where these type of restrictions are important. You have, uh, you have controls at the very local level from the tax authority, from the code of commerce and so on and so forth. 
Uh, now, it could be more difficult, more difficult to impose those controls if instead of having an, an account-based CBDC, you have a token-based CBDC, where, where, where basically, I mean, let's, let's think of a token as the, the equivalent, a truly digital equivalent of a, of a bill. You carry it in your pocket and you go here and there and you make, you make the payments. Uh, you know, there, there, it's also, it's also, there, there are also some forms of controls. AML, CFT, I mean, you also cannot, walk, or you're not supposed to, to walk from one currency, from one country to another with a huge amounts of cash. So those type of, of frictions, I would say, that already exist, at some point, uh, we will might have to consider them, no? Uh, the point here is that, uh, yes, it could be a risk, uh, but I think it should be controllable. So, for example, when, when central banks discuss the possibility of a token-based CBDC, uh, the, 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 the sort of, of where the, the conventional wisdom is, is the directing is into having a token-based uh, transactions for small transactions. So that means that you would have controls on the amount of money you can hold on your wallet. No, so uh, again, this is a this is a way of uh, 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 achieving the balances that we want. So, in the same spirit, um, we all are aware of criticisms that the euro area issuing the five hundred euro note or the U.S. dollar continuing to issue the $100 note or facilitate criminal transactions by having large bills. I realize this is not a primary motivation, but do you see the introduction of CBDCs as a way of further constraining the ability of criminal or terrorist activities to use the payment system? Well, in a way, yes. I mean, uh, the, the, um, a, a very important, and this is a very important political and societal issue that cannot be solved exclu exclusively for central banks. But, but you know, I mean, bills uh, and, and coins were introduced uh, centuries ago. And uh, at the time, the, the question, do, do, do you want absolute anonymity was not an issue. Uh, anonymity in, in the transactional aspect and the holding aspect of, of those assets. Now, today, uh, the issue of anonymity will be an issue when discussing CBDC. Even if it's token-based, uh, let's, let's be very frank, there will be data that can uh, at least track some of the transactions. And therefore, also, the, the discussion on data protection will be huge and will be very important. So this issue of data protection anonymity will be will will be central, and uh, I would say in today's society, I would I would think that it would be quite difficult to unravel un un unleash a, a new type of monetary system that uh, would provide the flexibility that cash provides today. Uh, it will be at the end of the day. I mean, that's something not for the central banks to, to decide because this goes beyond uh, the mandate of central banks. But I think it's a very important discussion and uh, we have to have it. And, uh, uh, and yes, if, if it's possible to prevent that the uh, central bank money is used for illegal activities, uh, uh, we should try to stop that. Thank you for being so frank, Dr. Karstens. And uh, you you have addressed at times these issues of privacy. And my Peterson Institute colleague, Martin Charzemba, has in particular written with concern about this and noted your recent speech that you know central banks would not need to see every retail transaction. On the other hand, inherent in this, it seems Martin points out that by definition, you do have the ledger, so you do have all this information. So is it? So it, 
I agree with you, this isn't solely on the central banks, but so as part of the proposition that we're, we ordinary citizens can trust central banks with our private data more than we can trust a digital platform or a, a Bitcoin. Is that part of the value proposition of central bank digital currencies? Well, I mean, let, let, me, let me introduce two things here. One is, of course, some of these might be taken care of by limiting the scope of the application of CBDC. So for example, if you have a token-based token system and you say you cannot hold more than X amount of money in those token wallet and transactions cannot be larger than this, you know, and so it, it basically uh, really addresses the needs of retail payments, uh, then you probably can be a, a more liberal in quotation marks about the issue of autonomy and, and, and basically uh, from a technological point of view, you can really make it a, a almost impossible to follow that information. Uh, whoever runs the system would not have the, 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 the let's say, the, the, the mandate and the authority to look into the transactions. But there you are, you are limiting the, 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 the amount of damage that could be done through the system. Um, it, could, it, could, it, could, it could encompass huge amounts of transactions. I mean, if, if you say, and I'm just throwing a figure, you know, uh, you can have no more than $50,000 and you cannot make payments of more than X thousand of dollars, it, would, it would probably could take care of most retail transactions. Now, when, 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 what are, what, what is what you would not be able to do? <laughs> what you would not be able to do is to have millions of dollars there and transfer millions of dollars through those means. And there is where the, the real criminal activity is taking place. So there are ways, there are ways to, 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 to addressing this. One is by restricting to some extent the nature of token based CBDC. The other is to have a more open system. But then the question is, uh, what, what, uh, what uh, instruments will you give to the authorities to make sure that that system is not abused by criminal activities? Thank you. Um, picking up on, in your remarks, you were talking about three components of the CBDC's interaction with the international monetary system. And one of the things you, you mentioned, in fact, that the first was the issue of enhancing the efficiency of cross-border payments. And you talked about multi-CB, multi, I think the term is multi-CBTCs, if not MBTCBTCs. Um, the People's Bank of China has proposed some kind of DLT-based inter-CBTC payment system. So again, as you say in your speech title, taking this to the practical level, is that a promising avenue what the PBOC has promised or not promised, excuse me, proposed? Um, who would run such a system? Would it be the BIS? Would it be a private sector? Would it be groups of voluntary central banks? How, again, you don't have to comment specifically on the PBOC proposal, but when you say we wanna move forward on MCBC, MCBDC, excuse me, um, <laughs> Practically, what's the way you want to go? Yeah, um, I mean, first of all, um, let me just be precise. The 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 the, the e, e yuan is not based on on, on D, DLT, but that's not the, the 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 crux of the of the commentary. I I think I think this opens up a, a great opportunity to make cross border payments uh, sort of seamless. Uh, we can start with a clean slate. What has happened is that uh, uh, domestic payment systems have been developed independently with uh, responding mostly to domestic considerations. And then the question comes, how are we going to interconnect them? And so you're carrying a lot of restrictions, a lot of distortions that come from each domestic, domestic uh, practices. 
And then can be, at the same time, when I talk about distortions, they can be fair distortions. Just the fact that that one, one system is different from another from the point of view of the format of the payment, that, that, that by itself is just a restriction. So today we have the alternative to start from zero. And, and, and basically the three systems that are being explored is one to have compat com compatibility of national CBDCs. The other is interlinking them. And the other is, is integrating a CBDC. Uh, basically, uh, uh, where we are going is into, I mean, what, what our survey says interlinking CBDCs, which means that each CBDC can run on their own system, but from the design, you are going to incorporate certain characteristics that will make it really easy to do the interlinkage including the foreign exchange transactions, having the same type of formats, having the same type of messages. Uh, if you want to make more payments, you don't need to, you, you, you just need to have one connection instead of having a whole chain of connections just to do uh, one payment. So uh, many, many of the frictions that exist today, uh, exist today can be eliminated. And uh, uh, the G20 is, 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 is giving the umbrella for this work. And in particular here, the BIS, the, uh, with the support also of the, of the IMF, we're working on this. Uh, and uh, in, the, in, our, in, in our BIS innovation hope we already have projects going on uh, where, where you can assess how uh, you can interlink the, the different si systems and make the convertibility seamless and uh, reduce uh, the transaction costs. But just the fact that you can start with a clean slate uh, is extremely powerful and it will give us a lot of mileage. Thank you. Um, we're getting near the end of our time and we've had a lot of very good audience questions. I'm trying to group them and I'm not giving credit to everybody who asks with apologies. Um, so when you talk about a clean slate, um, there is a lot of interest in private sector financial innovation. FinTech has become very hot among investors. I mean, th there are questions about why it does need to be the central banks and the BIS for that matter, leading the innovation rather than it arising out of private sector actors, out of payment systems act out of non-bank non financial intermediaries. Um, so when you talk about the clean slate and innovation, could you say a bit about any trade-offs you see or concerns about locking in perhaps one technology because the central banks go one way and then the private sector goes another way or would have gone another way if the central banks hadn't locked it in? Yeah, I mean, this is a this is a real relevant issue. I mean, we have to see how, I mean, what what one of the objectives of what we're doing in the central bank community is to to try to find the way in which the unique characteristics that say central bank bring to the table can be used in a more efficient way. I mean, in principle, with the CBDC, with the CBDC. Uh, uh, we want to support competition. We, 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 we have to find ways into which uh, uh, payment service providers that might not necessarily be banks uh, could use a sovereign currency and could use at some point CBDC and enhance competition. Uh, what, what I think the type of innovation, and I think that there, here is where there, there, there also hasn't been that much, well, that, 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 you know, I think that, that, that the, the type of innovation that, that uh, would be probably more, more, or it has, it's more limited or it's different, is, is the one that runs on, cur on currencies that, that are not in some way, uh, uh, in some way uh, that doesn't incorporate the, 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 the elements that central bank brings to the trusty worth, trustworthiness of the, of the currency 
and that pro promises a finality. You know, I think I think our our uh, the, the key message that at least I I would insist is that uh, the currency that is provided by central banks is the the is 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 a core contribution to society, and I think that using that, that currency is the one that can can enhance the value added also that a uh, private innovation bring. But to try to compete with central bank, with central bank money is very difficult and it can be painful for society to learn that. I mean, we have a very broad history of uh, many different private private efforts to come with uh, private money, to compete with, with central bank money. And, uh, and at the end, what I described in my presentation is, 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 is what happens. At some point, you need to have a finality you need to have liquidity, intraday liquidity, and at some point you need to have a lender of last resort. You don't have that in many uh, privately created currencies, and that at some point can be a, a problem. Now, if you if you apply that at the national level, at some point you will fall into that problem, and therefore uh, the issue is why should we imbe invent again? Uh, something that works. Now let's build on that and let's open up the system so that private uh, innovation can uh, make it even better. I think that's a perfect note to end today on. Uh, it's one and a half minutes early, but I want you to have that last word and that rousing conclusion. Please let me, on behalf of our audience worldwide and our Peterson Institute team, thank you, Dr. Karstens, for your wide-ranging, very frank, and as intended, quite practical remarks about the way forward with central bank digital currencies uh, and explaining some of the motivations for why you and the BIS have chosen to make such a priority of this work. Thank you again for joining us today at the Peterson Institute. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.